Greetings and peace, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Tonight, I have the honor and privilege of being joined by my Sheikh and Morshid, Sheikh Wahid Azal of the Fatimiyya Sufi Order, who returns with us for part 18 in the series of dialogues and conversations that we are doing. And tonight for part 18, we have the honor of talking about the fatwa that the Noor Fatimiyya Sufi Order has issued against what we are seeing in Iran and the theocracy in Iran, which has suppressed the divine feminine. So it is my honor and my privilege to have our dear Sheikh Morshid, friend and brother here to discuss what has been going on and the Noor Fatimiyya Sufi Order stance against those mullahs in Iran. In the name of God, the just, um, I have issued a fatwa uh, against the regime in Iran uh, as of uh, Saturday, 24th of September. I will read the text of the fatwa in its original Farsi and then my English translation of it. And then I wish to address the brothers and sisters in Iran uh, of the Sufi tariqas in Persian, because I know that this, this video will most probably reach them. Uh, so a significant part after I read these texts is going to be in Farsi. Um, those who don't know the language, I apologize. Uh, but uh, the, one of the purposes of this podcast is to reach out to people that we know in Iran, uh, because this is the this is the real thing. And then we'll cover some other events. So let me read the text of the fatwa. Bismillah al-Akhar al-Afta. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-Akhar al-Afta. As jahatike, hukumat al-Zalim al-Jumhuriya Islamiya Iran, hukumat al-Mardumi nist, wa rejimi qazib wa khunkhari mi bashat, که در طول زمان لا مشروعیت خود را بر کل ثابت کرده است این فتفایی باشد و سفارشی بر هر شخص خدا برستی در مقاومت و مبارزه اتم با این حکومت چون از کبار تا سقار مفسد فل ارز می باشد پس این باشد اعلامیه قیام و جهاد بر علیه جمهوری اسلامی تا پیروزی حاصل شود و قلبه رژیم احبیمنی به دست مردم شریف ایران تحقق یابد و زنان ایران علل خصوص از منفوریت حکومت مرد سالار برای عبد الده آزاد شود. این است حکم الهی چه بسا ایام خجسته برای کلیه سکان ایران شهر نزدیک باشد و یا نور وحید ازل در بیستم ماه حق در سال ایده نورانی and the English translation, Fatwa Against the Islamic Republic. In the name of God, the most vengeful, the supreme victor. God, no other God is there besides it, the most vengeful, the supreme victor. Inasmuch as the tyrannical system of the Islamic Republic of Iran is not a people's government and is an irate, bloodthirsty regime, which during the passage of time has proven its illegitimacy to all, this is a fatwa and an instruction to every God-worshipping individual to resist and struggle completely against this unjust system because whether high or low, they, the IRI, are corruptors of the earth. So let this be an announcement to insurrection and a sacred struggle, a jihad against the Islamic Republic until victory ensues and the overcoming of this Ahrimanic satanic regime by the hands of the noble Iranian people is realized. And the women of Iran especially are forever freed from this loathsome system of patriarchy. This is the divine decree. Perhaps the auspicious days are near at hand for all the inhabitants of Iran and all light. Uh, signed Wahid Azal, the 20th of the month of truth in the 17th luminous year, which is uh, Saturday the 24th of September, 2022 common era. And now let me address uh, my fellow sisters and brothers in Iran. به نام خدا ای مردم شریف ایران و علل خصوص برادران و خواهران طریقت ایران این اعلامیه خیزش بر شما می باشد برخیزید و به مردم شریف ایران به فرزندان ایرانی در خیابانهای ایران کمک کنید حامی این مردم باشید برای سرنگونی و برانداختن این رژیم احریمنی شیطانی ولایت فقیه این جنبش و این انقلاب مردمی برای آزادی شما می باشد علل خصوص 
و برادران و خواهران سلسله طریقت قادری کردستان شما به برادران و خواهران خودتان هم در کردستان و هم غیر از کردستان کمک کنید حامی این مردم باشین برای سرنگونی این رژیم بلایت فقیر برادران و خواهران سلسله خاکسار در سراسر ایران به مردم ایران به فرزندان ایران کمک کنید حامی اینها باشید در خیابانها برادران و خواهران سلسله زهبیه شیراز و غیره بریزید در خیابانها و کمک و حامی مردم خود باشید روزهای آزادی در دست است زنده باد مردم ایران زن زندگی و آزادی This was a message to several of the Sufi orders in Iran, beginning with the Qadri Sufi order of Kurdistan, the sisters and brothers of that order, to aid and help their brothers and sisters on the streets of Iran against this regime of the guardianship of the jurisprudence. Uh, also to the brothers and sisters of the Khaksar Silsila, um, and the brothers and sisters of the, of the Silsila or the Tariqa of the Zahabiya, which are based in Shiraz to come to the aid of their brothers and sisters. This, this call also goes out to all the various sub-branches of the Nematullahi order uh, and all Sufis and all the riches of whatever branches and whatever sub-branches and whatever silsilas that exist in Iran to come out and help their brothers and sisters. This is a holy struggle. The holy struggle is a holy struggle for freedom of the Iranian people from, from the clutches of a fascist, deceitful, uh, and in my opinion, a foreign, imposed regime on the Iranian people since 1979. Uh, despite uh, perceptions that uh, the revolution of 1979 was a revolution um, uh, you know, represented by the figure of the Ayatollah Khomeini, the fact of the matter remains that Ayatollah Khomeini and the people around him lied to the Iranian people. When the people of Iran um, arose in 1979 to overthrow the dictatorship of the Shah, they were promised democracy and freedom. In fact, one of the chants, uh, one of the very prominent chants of that time was Istiqlal, independence, azadi, freedom, Jumhuri Islami, the Islamic Republic. At the time, people had no idea what Islamic Republic meant. Uh, they had no idea that the Ayatollah Khomeini was um, basically trying to impose the guardianship of the jurisprudence, the rule by the, by the Fogaha, the, the uh, jury consulates. This was never broached with the people of Iran until later after uh, the victory of the, of the revolutionaries against the Shah's regime. So there was a process of systematic deceit and lying against the Iranian people. And, and as more and more evidence has come to light over the last 40 years, it has become very clear to many that what happened in 1979 was in fact a regime change operation um, imposed by foreign actors, most likely oil companies and also certain governments like the French government uh, who, uh, who basically protected the Ayatollah Khomeini and his people for, for six months. Um, also, at the time, the Carter administration, who really didn't know what it was doing in the region, um, and the British, obviously, uh, at the time. And the reason for what happened in Iran is very clear to certain scholars who have been looking at that era, and that was because of the dirty politics of oil and the fact that um, in the last decade of his reign, despite the fact that the Shah was a dictator, a brutal dictator and corrupt, the, the fact is that he began to adopt a lot of the policies of Muhammad Mossadegh um, in that last decade, especially as far as OPEC is concerned. So he began to ver push very concertedly for a powerful independent OPEC bloc, which would have included all of the oil producing countries in the, in the world. Um, and had that project reached its termination, uh, which would have probably happened if the revolution in Iran had happened sometime in the 1980s, mid-1980s, the history of, of, of the world right now would be very different. The power centers of the world uh, would have shifted sometime around that 1980 period, probably to the Middle East. Iran would have been a very prosperous country. Um, there would have not been an eight-year war with Iraq. Uh, none of the events that we have witnessed over the last you know, 10, 15 years would have happened. And fundamentally, the most important thing of all is that there would have never been a political Islam, Islamism of this kind um, that we saw with, with the coming of Khomeini and the Islamic Republic in 1979. And political Islam since the rise of the Ayatollah Khomeini uh, and the Islamic Revolution in 1979 has proven itself to be a, um, 
a negative force like none other that we have witnessed before. Uh, arguably, all these various Sunni jihadi groups that that came out in the, in, in the night in, in late 19s and the zeros uh, of the centuries, they all took their initial inspiration from the events that transpired in Iran in 1979, the Khomeini. And we have witnessed that political Islam as a force is fundamentally a fascist force that is even against the interest of Muslims locally on the ground in, in, in Muslim countries because political Islam seeks to impose by force um, an, a completely ideologized Islam. And it does not have any room for difference or pluralism or any kind of view where um, there are different interpretations or approaches to, to scripture, to the implementation of the Sharia. It has a very straight jacketed approach to all of these things, and it seeks to eliminate all of its opposition internally within the Muslim world, and obviously then externally outside of the Muslim world. It is aggressive, it is violent, and it is ultimately terrorist. So the importance, the world historical importance of this moment right now, if, and not even if, when the regime in Iran finally collapses, this will be the defeat of Islamism as a as the political force that it has been since the early 1980s. That means then that the writing on the wall will be for the Taliban, the writing on the wall will be for uh, the Wahhabis in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the writing on the wall will be even for a lot of these Gulf sheikhs. Um, and there it will be a tectonic <clears throat> sea change of a kind, probably as big, if not bigger than what happened with the collapse of the Soviet Union, except with the collapse of the Soviet Union, even though it went into a negative direction, um, the collapse of Islamism will undoubtedly create the space in the region for genuine um, native democratic forms of governance in that region. That means that totalitarian ideology such as the, the, the Islamists tried to push in the Muslim world will be forever discredited. Um, and so then there will be a concerted effort to uh, create native forms of democratic polity, right? Uh, now, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with liberalism as, as it is defined in the West, although, you know, there are resemblances. But Dr. Mossadegh, for example, which is probably the most important example that we find in, in, that, in the history of that region, was not a liberal in, in the Western sense. He was a liberal in a native Iranian sense. And had his project reached its conclusion, the Middle East would be a much different place today. But even with the failure of, of his project and the coup d'etat of August 1953, uh, many of the events that, that transpired in the Middle East, for example, the revolution in Egypt, were all inspired by the example of Dr. Mossadegh. So Iran is a trendsetter, as we keep seeing over and over again in the 20th century and even now. So this will be a sea change, and particularly because of the fact that it is the women of Iran that are, have spearheaded this movement. And it, is a, it was an Iranian Kurdish woman, an Iranian minority woman, uh, who became the symbol of this insurrection of the Iranian people and this revolution, Masa Amini, God rest her soul. Uh, this means that the status of women in that region, beginning with Iran, is about to change. And the Islamists, the political Islamists, the, you know, the ideology of political Islam, um, rather than championing a native form of, of women's rights, uh, in, instead adopted an extremely obscurantist and reactionary discourse on, on the status of women. And what that has done is it has stymied all of these societies, right? <clears throat> contrary to even scriptural, uh, you know, edicts or contrary to even, you know, a, a balanced scriptural approach to the issue of women in the Quran itself. Now, some people who read the Quran literally and take uh, the Quran literally would beg to differ, but the fact of the matter is that the issue of women's rights. Let me just take this step here. You know, Sheikh, that's that's interesting, and <coughs> you know, just to add something. Uh, first, I would say Nur alaykum, Bismillah, and I would like to say the Shahada of the Fatimiya Tariqa, which is La ilaha illallah, Fatima wajh Allah. There is no god but God, and Fatima is the face of God. And what we're seeing right now in Iran is from my perspective is that divine feminine that's basically giving the retribution to these western backed forces that have suppressed the people of that region for so long and um it's an honor for us to witness something like this in our lifetimes very much so. in, in fact this is what 
surprisingly, uh, a a philosopher like Zizek, who you know I had had no time for until recently, um, basically came out and said he said exactly verbatim what you just said, and he even went even further saying that what the people of Iran are doing, what the women of Iran are doing, is of such a magnitude that even those of us in the West who have looked at ourselves as being progressive forces can learn a thing or two from what the people of Iran are doing at the moment. <coughs> See, this is, the, this is the importance of this moment, is that there's a tectonic shift happening. As democracy is being assaulted in the West, and as, as democratic institutions throughout the West are uh, under siege by, by authoritarian and fascist forces everywhere within those societies, whether we're talking mm -hmm. about the United States or Europe or elsewhere, for a grassroots, women-based, women-centered, de social democratic movement to arise that seeks ultimately to establish that kind of an order in Iran is huge, right? So it just now basically shifts the pole of the discourse of freedom and the locus of freedom movements throughout the world once this succeeds to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Something that nobody could have anticipated even a year ago, but it's happening right now at this very moment. And this will succeed. You know, I published an article with, with Counterpunch last week. You can link this yeah, in the description box of the YouTube. Um, yeah. And I said that this, see, the, what has happened here, and you have a lot of spin happening from various sectors saying that this is all regime change, CIA, this, that, the usual canards that we hear from people. <laughs> but this happens sp spontaneously, see, and it also happened because it was triggered by the Islamic Republic itself. Yes. Had they not accosted this woman, Mahsa Amini, in the, in the Tehran metro on the 13th of this September when she was arrested, uh, we wouldn't be here right now. There wouldn't have been this explosion in Iran. They triggered it themselves. It was not the CIA. You have, you have this punditry in Al-Manar, this Hezbollah-based uh, news corporation who are <clears throat> presently very actively spinning these really porous and ridiculous conspiracy theories, claiming that Mahsa Amini was a Komila or, or a Kurdish, violent Kurdish separatist uh, uh, operative that was basically on a suicidal mission in Tehran, and this is why it happened, right? Without, you know, even explaining how it became that this, 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 <laughs> this kamikaze Kurdish separatist happened to, you know, be picked up by the, by the moral police. So, you know, they don't address any of these things. They don't address the fact that she was then beaten in, by these people, that she collapsed on their watch, that, you know, um, what the independent reports are saying is that she, was, her, she had fractures on her skull. So, you know, if this sort of nonsensical narrative is to be even taken, even entertained, remotely entertained, then... Um, these people need to explain that how is it that, that, that it was the moral police, it was officials and law enforcement of the Islamic Republic itself that fell into the trap of this, of this young girl. This young 22-year-old who had come with her brother to Tehran to, mm. you know, to, to go to some kind of a wedding, and they were arrested, both of them, brother and sister in the Tehran metro, um, mm. and it all unfolded from there. And from the evidence that we have, this woman's hijab was not that bad. She just wore something that had a sort of a pattern to it that kind of displeased these so-called uh, moral police, Gash the Ershad. And so they picked her up on her brother. And, you know, things obviously escalated with these fascists. Um, and so, you know, they took her in, beat her up, and she died on her watch. And these sorts of things are, are business as usual uh, in Iran and have been business as usual, especially when you have had these hardliners in power, whether it was under the eight years of Ahmadinejad, and now for the last year when, with Raisi in power as the president of Iran. Um, you know, the whole concept of Gashti Ershad, the moral police that you have under the Islamic Republic, by definition is a fascist, uh, it, it reveals the fascist nature of the Islamic Republic. So all these apologists of the Islamic Republic, whether internally or whether amongst these extremely misled uh, people in, in the West who are supporting the IRI right now need to understand a system that has a moral police that wishes to impose a public morality by force as a matter of law 
by definition defines itself as fascist under any rubric, any definitional rubric of fascist that you want. These people are fascists. So, you know, once this reality is accepted, then it follows very quickly that the nature of the system of the Velayat of Tati, the guardianship of the Jewish through this is the basis of the system of Iran, by definition, is a totalitarian dictatorship that will stop at nothing to brutalize and oppress its own people um, who don't toe its line. And the issue of dress is very fundamental, and the issue of women mm. is fundamental. Now, I have nothing against women, Muslim-believing women, who wish to wear the hijab by choice. That is their choice. Their choice needs to be respected. But the vast majority of people who do not wish to observe this should have the right not to observe it. So women who don't wish to wear the hijab shouldn't have to wear the hijab. But what has happened now is that the regime itself radicalized the situation by killing and murdering this woman, right? Um, this created the social explosion, so the hijab is off, and we have had, today is actually the 20th day, we're now entering the 21st day of the national protests in, in, in Iran, or this Iranian revolution, um, and women have burnt their hijab right and left. Women are walking the streets of Iran uh, without the hijab on. School children, school girls are going to school without their hijab. Their teachers, some of their teachers are encouraging them. Videos of this can be found all over the internet. People are sending videos, even though the uh, you know the internet is supposedly officially shut down in Iran at the moment. People are still managing to get their footage out there, showing that there has been a mass defiance of the of the imposed uh, hijab, um, of this mandatory hijab that this regime has put on people uh, since Khomeini came back to Iran, and there is no going back. So you know, as some have said. If the hijab in Iran under the Islamic Republic represented a proverbial Berlin Wall, once this Berlin Wall falls, which has now fall, fallen, because the, the majority of the Iranian women are refusing uh, you know, to comply with the mandatory hijab, then this means the end of the Islamic Republic, period. Because um, all, not, it was just a month after Khomeini came back from France, after the revolution, he succeeded in toppling the Shah's regime. After they had executed uh, all these military officers, immediately the issue of hijab came up, uh, and immediately these Hezbollahis or the or the people following Khomeini's line began to um, impose their will on this issue of hijab on Iranian women. So there was a series of demonstrations by by women uh, all throughout Tehran um, and other cities against mandatory hijab. There were even some clerics. For example, the late Ayatollah Talaqani, who um, was a sort of ideological rival to the Ayatollah Khomeini, um, and some believe was even murdered by the Ayatollah Khomeini in September of 1979, um, he actually went on record saying that that we don't wish to impose mandatory veiling, but um, we wish to you know give people the choice of whether they want to wear the veil or not, and that he said that in Islam. Uh, the issue of veiling is a choice. It is not a mandatory issue. But Khomeini was an Islamist, and he was a, uh, you know, he came from an extremely rigid interpretation of these issues, not to mention that he was trying to impose an ideological state on Iran, uh, worse than what had preceded him. And so the issue of hijab and the issue of imposing the Islamic Republic with him as the supreme leader were tied together in a knot. So if he had given way, or if he had given um, any leeway on the issue of hijab, all the other agendas that he had for Iran would have also fallen by the wayside. This is why once the issue of the hijab <clears throat> is, is gone, you know, once that is that defiance becomes a mass issue as it has now in Iran, um, then the Islamic Republic and its legitimacy is basically gone. And so what we're witnessing now are the stages, are a revolutionary stage, where the regime has completely lost all of its legitimacy. Um, no one believes a th single thing it says anymore. I mean, the other day, only, I mean, after 16 days of silence, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, the, the so-called Supreme Leader, came out, gave a speech, basically um, reiter reiterating and repeating the very same lines and talking points that he has said every time, you know, blaming the victim and gaslighting the Iranian people over this issue. Without addressing the brutality of, of the system itself, uh, the mm. fact that that it was the moral police, the Gashli Ershad, 
that were responsible for killing that woman, the fact that, that during the protest that it has been the security forces that have brutalized people, um, killing even more women on, on the streets, more youngsters on the street, uh, and the fact that this regime um, has been acting and behaving this way from the very first day it came to Iraq, despite all the promises that they gave, all the promises that the Ayatollah Khomeini gave from Paris, um, they have lied, consistently lied. Moreover, this is not, a, a, I mean, you know, certain of my comrades back in Iran, you know, because of, of, of the brutality of this regime and the deceitfulness of this regime, um, and the totalitarian nation of, of this regime, um, it has become very common to blame Islam as a whole, right? Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is that if you if you investigate Khomeini's project very closely, it will become very apparent quickly that what Khomeini did was unprecedented, and that by the definitions of, of Islamic jurisprudence itself, it's a form of bid'ah, because the guardianship of the jurisprudence from the point of view of Shiite law is basically usurping the rights of the Imam of the time. So, and this is one of the reasons why in Iran. Uh, Khomeini was called the Imam, which in a Shiite context is, is, is actually not something that ought to be done. I mean, in, in, Sun, in the Sunni context, it's no problem because the Imam is the person who leads, a, uh, you know, leads the prayer in the mosque. But to call a revolutionary leader an Imam is basically to accede that he is one of the Masums, one of the infallibles. And no yeah. one ever questioned this on, on a popular level. Most of the ulama, in the, in most of the clergy, in the mosques or in the seminaries um, seem to have been silenced not to question this, but this is this was a form of bida. So Khomeini basically constructed an ideology. This was an ideologized form, form of, of Islam, but Islam itself being a kind of a, almost a window dressing um, rather than the real thing. Because when you look into the very ideology of the Vilayat of Faqih, the guardianship of the jurisprudence, and how this has been characterized and delineated within the Iranian constitution, the notion of the Vilayat al-Mutlaqiyya Faqih, the absolute guardianship of the jurisprudence, shows what kind of a heresy this is. Because under the notion of the Vilayat al-Mutlaqiyya Faqih, the absolute guardianship of the jurisprudence, the absolute, the, the jurisprudent, the ruler, Right, the Rahbat can even at any time he, he has the right to promise something and take this promise back. Mm. He, he has the right to even um, defy very clear Quranic precepts. He can violate the Sharia. He can then even command new new edicts, whether based on the Sharia or not. So in essence, what the concept of the Vilayat al is doing on a state level is basically claiming that these individuals that are occupying their street are divine and are on the same level as the prophets and messengers and could issue a ruling, break that ruling, make a promise, break that promise, which is part of the whole uh, nuzul and mansuk, the nas, you know, the, the, the whole reality that we have in the Quran itself, where at certain points, for instance, the, in Mecca, the Prophet revealed one thing, a ruling, and then once they were in Medina, these were abrogated. Like the, the issue of the Qibla in Islam initially is, is a good point, uh, where initially the Qibla in Islam was Jerusalem, and then after a certain period of time, the Prophet changed the direction of the Qibla from, from Jerusalem to Mecca. Right? But these were exigent mm. circumstances. But under the philosophy of the Vilayat al faqih the guardianship of the jurisprudence, the jurisprudence guardian has the right to do this. Exactly the same thing in his own context, in anything. So he can make a ruling, he can break a ruling. Um, life and the, the, the issue of life and death is completely in his hands. And once we can't come to the era of Ali Khamenei, the second uh, ruler of the Islamic Republic after Ayatollah Khomeini, then what we began to witness was a complete concentration of power on every level. So every organ of state, every organ of state, from law enforcement to the judiciary, to even the legislative branch of the Iranian Majlis, is completely under the thumb of the, the jurisprudent guardian. So this is, in essence, an Islamicized form of an absolute monarchy. 
the very mm -hmm. thing that the Iranian people in 1978 and 1979 arose to overthrow. The mullahs reestablished it that rather than the crown, they replaced the crown for the turban. It's exactly the same thing. But what this is, is even more dangerous than absolute monarchy because it is claiming a complete divine mandate without proving this and trying to create, not even, it's not even trying to create the, the, the early society of the Muslims in, in Mecca and Medina, it's trying to create something else. And it's claiming to be the government of the Mahdi while being simultaneously extremely ambiguous about the actual identity of the Mahdi. And this is where a lot of controversy has arisen as to whether these individuals occupying the chair of the Vilayat of Fatu Umuwam, the jurisprudence guardian, are themselves actually claiming that position. This has always been a very ambiguous point of, of contention amongst the detractors of the IRA, amongst the, the seminary itself. Was Khomeini claiming to be the Mahdi? Is Ayatollah Ali Khomeini today claiming to be the same thing? And if that's the case, from the point of view of, of Shiite political theory, these people are claiming absolute infallibility. Totally. I mean, in, in other words, they're claiming to be God-men. Yes. And this is a form, this is shirk in every conceivable way. Now, even in, in, in the Sufi orders, in the context of Suluk, for example, uh, you know, a peer or a morshid in the context of wayfaring and, and the um, management of, of his singular morib or murids uh, should be should have that kind of, of, of um, you know, should be obeyed. However, on some very basics, you know, a, a Morshid will not uh, infringe on the moral and sacerdotal limits that exist, which is what these people are doing. And Morshid will not kill his own Mori, right? Which is what Khomeini has done. Countless, countless individuals who followed him initially who then once they realized the kind of dictatorship that he was trying to establish in Iran, turned against him and he had them, these people murdered. Um, and on and on it goes. So this is, in, in, this is, this Vilayat system of the Vilayat of Fahri, in its Iranian context, is in essence the system of the Dajjal. And these yes. people were, are the representatives of the, of the, the, of the shaitan itself. Um, and what they have done in Iran and the world for the last 43 years is unconscionable. And if you, we, you will realize the extent of the damage that was done to Iran and to that region after these people, inshallah, will, are, are thrown out on their ears very soon. Um, this, they impoverished the Iranian nation. You know, their whole focus became in wanting to export this so-called revolution of theirs, this Islamic revolution of theirs beyond the borders. That means that they didn't, they were not prepared anymore to um, respond to the needs of their own people. So that all the revenue and all the money that they got became basically their um, piggy bank to finance movements, groups, et cetera, throughout the region and the world, right? And so um, despite the fact that the West itself is guilty of, of countless things, but when they call Iran a state sponsor of terrorism, they're not, this is not a joke, it is. And it became that way almost immediately after Khomeini take, took power. This, this incessant sponsoring groups like, for example, the Hezbollah of Lebanon, uh, various groups in, in, in Pakistan, and not all of them are Shiite. Uh, this on again, off again dalliance of the regime with the various Takfiri groups in Afghanistan. Yep. For, for example, one of the mo major figures uh, of the Afghan Mujahideen, who was the most fundamentalist and insane figure of that entire uh, uh, group of people was like Gulbadin Hikmatyar. Gulbadin Hikmatyar was the proto-ISIS. He was the proto-Taliban. Um, and he, during the entire course of that war, that Soviet uh, occupation of Afghanistan, the war against uh, the Soviet occupation by the Afghan Mujahideen, was living in Iran. It was based out of Iran. And later on, it turned out that this man was CIA as well. And obviously, the, the regime of the Ayatollahs knew this well enough, but they didn't care. Um, initially, the regime in Iran was against the Taliban. Then once the Taliban fell afoul and were overthrown after 9-11, all of a sudden the regime in Iran is buddy-buddy with Taliban. The same Taliban that was persecuting the Shia Hazara, the yes. Afghan Shiites, right? So, you know, the, the, 
cynical nature of this regime and its alliances and its, you know, with, with you know, groups and individuals who are criminals by any definition is, is, is beyond reproach. In the meantime, um, initially during the early years of the revolution, while Khomeini was talking the talk of Irfan and, you know, kind of, it looked like he was at least, you know, willing to concede, you know, some kind of existence to the Sufi orders. It didn't take very long for that to, that to end. Um, so they went after all of the Sufi orders except one, in, in particular, which was the Gonavadis. Um, but eventually, even the Gonavadis Sufi order fell afoul of the regime, and right now they have been the most outspoken critics of the uh, of the IRI. Um, you know, it's war against the Kurds. You know, from the very first day that Khomeini set foot in Iran, um, even though the Shah's regime also had its problems with the Kurds, but with the Mullahs and with these Ayatollahs, the, the the problem with the Kurds, it was totally exacerbated. And that was because the regime exacerbated it from, from day dot when they came back to Iran. You know, they incited uh, these people. They, they not only did not respond to their needs, um, but were out to stamp them out at every conceivable opportunity. And when you push the people's back against the wall, it doesn't matter who it is. They will, they will eventually fight back. And the Kurds are not a people that are to be pushed around, and they shouldn't be pushed around. You know, um, as far as I'm concerned, the Kurdish people are the original Iranians. They're much more pure in their Iranianness than most of the other ethnic uh, Persian and Iranian minorities. Um, some great figures have come out of the, out of the Kurdish people. Uh, I want not Salahuddin, but but many great Sufis. Even Shahabuddin Sohrabi was partially Kurdish. Um, so <clears throat> Kurdistan and the Kurdish people are in Iranian people, more Iranian than Iranians. These people need to be respected, their traditions, their language, their food, um, their very existence and raison d'etre should be respected. Um, even though the Shah, like I said, had his own problems with these people, once the mullahs came, his problem went from bad to worse. And it is no accident, I think, of providence that this current revolution in Iran should be ignited with the martyrdom of a, of a Kurdish woman. Because these Kurdish people, especially the Kurdish women, have had their back against the wall by these fascists, this malocracy of, of the IRI, uh, more than any other, uh, more than anybody but yes. You know, while certain, you know, very noisy minority religious groups, you know, make a lot of uh, uh, noise and fanfare in the Western media about their own plight, the fact is that no one has been as, as badly brutalized as the Kurds have in the last 42 years. No one. Well, I'm confident that this is going far. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we, like I mentioned in that article with Counterpunch, we have literally crossed the Rubicon. Uh, there is no going back. There is, I mean, there is almost zero chance that um, this regime will be able to silence the people. And what is very interesting to me is that the predominant um, sample of the people who are going out of the street are, ch are basically 15, 16, 17, 18 year old children. Yes. Yeah. Um, who are far more radicalized than even the generation of the green movement. And this is what, what a lot of people of that green uh, uprising of 2009 are commenting, that these kids are far beyond us in what they're doing and what they're saying and, and the fact and how they're defying this regime. I mean, at this point in 2009, um, basically the vast majority of people who had initially come out protesting uh, the, the, the stealing of the 2009 election had gone home. Certain people had been arrested and taken to Evin or whatever, or to Kahizak. Uh, but this continues. Um, you know, officially, we, we, we believe that there's over 150, 160 people who have been killed so far, most of them girls. Um, but this continues and it's escalating. With each passing day, this is escalating, escalating. Now, you know, this regime is brutal and it will stop at nothing. But what is, but the news that is coming from the ground is that the security forces are also being now exhausted, right? Especially because a lot of this is happening in sporadic parts of, of, of cities and it's happening all over the Iranian landscape. Um, and some of them, few here and there, are even beginning to join the pro protesters. Mm -hmm. um, so <clears throat> at this point, you know, it is 
I think fair to say that this is like unlike anything that we have seen in the last 40 years. Um, and there is no doubt, at least in my mind, that this is going to succeed, that the Mullah's regime is going. It is on its way out. We are witnessing history. Um, and that everybody should be a part of this, even non-Iranians, in my opinion, should be part of this in giving uh, their help, their moral support, or whatever they can uh, to these people, their prayers, you know, for the success of these people. Because um, I don't believe that this will just stop at Iran, right? This is a wave that is coming over this whole planet. Yes. Uh, that is going to change a lot of things, and it's going to, the law of unintended consequences is going to be at play on every level here. And I should mention the following. Um, this current revolution in Iran started precisely 19 days after I completed the Bayat, after I completed the last chapter, the 19th chapter or the 19th unity of the Bayat on the, on the 26th of August. Mahsa Amini was arrested on the 13th of September, which triggered what is going on. I look at these signs. These are the signs you know, that are coming from above. The fact that woman is at the centerpiece of this is also another indication to me that her hand is in, in this. Yes. Her hand is, is moving. She is moving this. And that Mahzo Amini at that very moment was the face of Fatima. She was the, 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 the watch Allah. She was the face of God. She was the martyr. She was the, host, the female Hussein at that very moment. And Yazid and the forces of, of, of uh, the Umayyads and the Sufyanis at that moment was were the Gashdi Arshad, the morality police, the Islamic mm -hmm. Republic. Right? Now, you know, most of this pious mob is going to have a real problem with someone talking about a female Hussein. That is what Mahsa Amini is. She's a female Hussein. And, you yeah. know, if, 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 if the pious go every year in, in Taswa and Ashra and beat their chest, um, about this holy figure that di died over a thousand years ago. This happened today in Iran, in your own country. This woman was Hussein. That woman at that very moment was Hussein and Fatima. It was Fatima and Hussein in body at that very moment. And if these people can get their head around this, they will realize immediately that the regime that they are serving or the regime that they are remaining silent to is the regime of Yazid. Mm-hmm. That's absolutely right, Sheikh, because um, right now, just looking at the Persian people, and if you look at their history, they are a strong and warrior people. If you look at their history, who they are, the trials and tribulations and victories and successes that their rich history has entailed in that land, myself coming from a Persian ancestry, I know those people will overcome this latest enemy that's there on their land, and they will overcome these forces, and the new generation of uh, Persian men and women that are growing up, uh, we could compare them to the Generation Z of America, the ones that are not tolerating any kind of abuse from anybody, whether it's workplaces, organizations. These people are connected, they're educated. These are the return of many of those warrior souls that are coming back into the, into the modern man and woman. And I'm happy to see that they're taking their control back. It's, uh, and you're right, it's not only in Iran, it's happening in my home country. It's other places. People realize that there was that Western um, hold over their leaders that were suppressing these people and not giving them their due rights. In Islam, it tells you there is no compulsion in religion. That so these people, be, yeah. these people are acting like gods and they, they need to be held accountable, which is shirk and bidda. And also the aspect of how Islam teaches you to love and respect and honor your woman. Heaven lies at the feet of your mother. Yeah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and out of all of the 99 names, you can call me Allah or you can call me Rahman, which is a feminine name. So the Divine Mother is bringing divine retribution in Iran, in Pakistan, in other Muslim countries which had these Western-backed puppets and leaders that suppressed their people while their families and their grandkids were living lavish lifestyles in France and England and America. And now that karma is all coming back because the mother in her all-seeing, all-knowing nature, she knows. She knows and she will ha hold all of these shayateen accountable one who have suppressed, suppressed the Persian people. And for all of our brothers and sisters that are listening in Iran or wherever you might be watching or listening to this from, 
please take heed to what Sheikh Wahid Azal is telling you and take the control back of your country. You are the Persian people, the warriors that people know in their history and fight back against these devils and take your history and your country back. Absolutely. Take your country back. There's a, actually a line in this um, uh, this wonderful song that was written for this event called Surud Zan. Um, I will link that uh, in the description. It's such a beautiful tune. This is what's what is happening. And this is, like I said, this is going to go beyond the borders of Iran. This is the hand of, of the mother herself, the, the yeah. goddess, uh, the true living godhead who is female behind this. Every woman in the streets of Iran who has pulled her hijab off is the face of God. She is yeah. the divine face projecting in every single one of these women against this patriarchal shaitan, which is the system. And what these people in power don't realize is that they are today what the Quraysh, what the pagan idol worshippers of Mecca were, that the Muslims were struggling against in the early part. They are the idolaters. They are the idol worshippers. They have made an idol, a Tagut, you know, out of their system of the Vilayat al Taqi and their supreme leader. They, they are committing shirk. These people are mushrikeen. But they are, they are complete infidels from any any definition that you want. So they should not in remotely be supported. And the thing is that that, that you know God does not require a government. Yes. The, the creator of all things has established the government of nature over the whole of existence. It it, it has what need does it have of human politics, you know, to represent it? It has no need for that. So the best form of government that we have, you know, at least in theory, is, is democracy, you know, where mm. ideology and, and, and the actual day-to-day -day administration of government are separate things. You know, if you, you know, what possible relevance does a belief in, in anything have to, for example, um, you know, your trash collection or your road building or your, you know, uh, you know, basic bureaucratic things that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. They have nothing to do with that, right? They, they, what they're contingent on is technology and know-how. You know, people should believe, but pe beliefs should never be imposed. When you, when you impose something, and especially with morality, you create the very opposite dynamic to that very thing. And this is what happened in Iran. You people forced the hijab on the women of Iran. 43 years later, they're now burning the hijab and burning their faces and calling death to your regime. This is the legacy of the Ayatollah Khomeini. So the Ayatollah Khomeini has failed. He was an abject failure because the man was a monster and a liar. And, yes. he, and he lied to the Iranian people. And um, you know because the Iranian people were so giddy to attain that freedom that had been denied them by the Shah's regime that they had fought for uh, at the turn of the last century, at the turn of the 20th century in the Constitutional Revolution. And because that previous regime had eliminated all viable opposition to itself other than the mullahs, they believe this man. And Khomeini played his, played his part very well, despite the fact that there were many that were sounding alarm bells, even in the early stages of the revolution of 1979. Um, but he proved to the world, he proved to the Iranian people that this man was a, a wolf and in, in a very transparent sheep clothing as well. So now, 43 years later, after all the damage that was done, after all the, the innocent blood that was shed, shed, all the brutalization, war, destruction, it is now time for change. And like I said, it is not going to stop in Iran. The, the, the creator of the universe, the creatrix of this universe has an agenda, and this is going to go beyond Iran. This is going to basically discredit Islamism, number one, as, as first order uh, of business, but then it will also go to the West. Yes. Because when we are talking about these three things, woman, zan, zendigi, mm -hmm. life, azadi, freedom, these are three things that are actually attributes of the goddess, of the feminine goddess, of Fatima, or whatever name you want to call her. Life is an attribute of, of the female, the f female attribute, divine attribute. So that means that this system of capitalism that is destroying the environment of this planet is now also going to be progressively under the microscope. And in Iran, these mullahs destroyed the environment over the last 40 years. 
So, you know, the issue of environmental destruction is one of the, one of the things that any future system in Iran um, is going to have to address because they, uh, over the last 40 years, certain parts of Iran have become completely parched. Areas of Iran that used to be agrarian bread baskets, like for example, the area around Lake Urumiye. Lake Urumiye is now completely dry. There's not a drop of water. This was a lake that has existed for thousands of years. And under the, the misplaced policies of these people where they built these dams uh, in areas of, of Iran where they shouldn't have and basically redirected natural water, water streams uh, into these man-made dams, they have completely parched these areas of Iran that were lush and, and uh, verdant for thousands and thousands of years. Um, mm. Much of the wildlife that was already beginning to disappear uh, during the period of the Shah, some of this stuff has, has just completely disappeared now. Um, so, you know, for the catch call of this revolution to be Zan, woman, Zendegi, life, is extremely important even beyond the obvious. Because this, there ha this has a environmental um, undertone because it is about the, the, the life of the female, which is the mother nature. And the yes. azadi, the freedom of this mother nature, you know, to, to create that, you know, that eco ecological equilibrium. And th that this system, whether in Iran or, or under the neoliberal capitalist juggernaut, has been bent on destroying. So it is going to start washing away that system as well. It's not, it, I mean, Iran is the start. This is going to go way beyond Iran. It's going to go way beyond Iran. People are seeing this already. Um, but at the same time, we're seeing a, a deceptive fascist regime like that of Vladimir Putin launch this aggressive war against the Ukrainian people. It yes. itself is now is, is, is on its last leg. We have been thoroughly defeated by the Ukrainians. Um, and to the point that Mr. Vladimir Putin is now saber rattling, threatening uh, a nuclear showdown with the West. I don't believe that this is going to be, happen. Um, I think this is a bluff. I think we have seen enough, and the, even the Russian establishment has seen enough. Um, I think that Mr. Vladimir Putin himself is going to be overthrown pretty shortly, uh, either in the internal coup d'etat or these soldiers that he's just uh, uh, basically drafted, um, calling this partial mobilization, are going to turn around um, and come to <laughs> Moscow and come to the Kremlin like they did uh, back in 1917 when they overthrew the Tsar. So, you know, it's, a, it's interesting, Sheikh, you mentioned that because Recently, I was watching the news reports and the people of, of Russia have come out who have been crushed by these sanctions because of um, Putin's criminal behavior. And they're saying we have to throw Putin to the trenches. So what's going on, what started in Iran has now ignited a fire all over the world where people are just coming out onto the streets and they're telling their people enough is enough. We're suffering with inflation, with crime. There's no resources for our children. We have to make a better world for them. And they're tired of these criminal leaders and their policies. So the mother goddess has ignited this uh, divine retribution globally. Yes, she has. And she won't stop and she, until you know, she gets, gets that revenge in full. So these, these, yeah. these fools who think that they can stop this, they can't stop this. They're going to be swept away by this. She's going to cut mm -hmm. their heads off, just like in that effigy of Kali. You know, she's going to cut their heads off. You know, the mother is out for blood and she's going to have her, she's going to be satisfied. Whatever yeah. you people think, you know, um, and this is for a just cause. This is for, <clears throat> for to reset a balance that has been out of whack for a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. um, so people need to take heed. And those people in the street, those women and men in the streets of Iran today, or even in, 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 uh, in Russia, who are defying the rulers are actually the face of God. They are the, the power of God. The, you know, in my philosophy, God works on the ground. Yes. With the people on the ground, with the meek. You know, when Jesus says that, you know, the meek shall inherit the earth, is be, the meek shall inherit the, the earth because God is always on the side of the meek. Yeah. So all this rhetoric that these people have been spouting, these mullahs, you know, they're talking about the mustakfirin, the arrogant, and the mustazafin, the wretched of the earth, they themselves are the mustakfirin. They are the arrogant. And it is their people who are the mustazafin, defying them right now. 
And they, they are, that is the God force that is in the streets of Iran or in the streets of Russia, defying its rulers. And, and also the women, um, you know, let's give credit where credit is due to these women in the United States that have been defying this ridiculous ruling by the, by the Supreme Court of the United States that overturned Roe versus Wade, that is yes. attempting to impose a Christian theocracy through law, you know, through a, a, a legal coup d'etat on the American people. Um, that also, the pushback against that is also God. Well, that's going to happen, Sheikh, because even here in America, you have so many women's issues. And uh, if you just Google women's crimes in America and women's issues in America, it's, you're, you're going to find an astronomical data. And most people here do not realize the United States of America is not a Christian country. If you look at the founding fathers and their Masonic background and what they envisioned this country to be, it has Masonic values, which is to have everyone have e equality and status and have everyone equal as brothers and sisters of the land. And those that say, OK, these organizations or this country is 100 uh, percent Judeo-Christian and they want to impose their theocracy or the Puritan ways or the, uh, the stuff that they were doing in the Salem witch trials, they are sorely mistaken because even here, the Generation Z, the men and women that are growing up now, they're not tolerating the lies that they're finding in their education system, the abuse that's being taking place in the workplaces. And uh, even something recently happened called mass resignations, where anywhere where there was abuse or any kind of um, uh, injustice taking place, these young kids, they took action. So the next generation that's coming, Sheikh, whether it's in Russia protesting against Putin and Iran against the Ayatollahs, here against the um, these Christian extremists who want to impose their views here, it's all going to collectively come together as all of the divine form of the goddess mother who's working through all of these beings to bring these tyrants to the ground. And it's going and it's happening. We're watching it unfold right now. And you know, on the on the spiritual front, I am I am uh, most honored uh, by her to have been part of this process to be part of the, that you know force that pushed the ignition switch on this and um i think that we will start to witness a different world over the next 10 to 15 20 years um yes. inshallah i will live to see at least the beginning of this um if not my daughter will be here um and it is you know for her generation and, and the generations after her that uh you know all of this is going to unfold and they're going to be the beneficiaries of it um but this is in a sense a very good thing and um you know I am happy that, th that this has come. I asked for a sign after I finished writing the Bayan um, on that 26th of August, you know, to give me a sign, you know. And what is happening in Iran is something that deep down every Iranian exile has been hoping and wishing for for all of these 40 plus years. And this yes. is what she gave. You know, the one thing that we have all been, you know, really wishing and hoping for for all this time is now coming to pass. This was my sign that, that, that this is now unfolding. And particularly because in the Bayan, I called for, you know, very explicitly, you know, that the system of patriarchy has to be overthrown. And that yes. at least even if it is for an interim <clears throat> period, a certain period of time, that the women of this planet need to take power over the men. And the men have to then support this matriarchal power structure. And we're witnessing this very thing unfold in Iran right now. It is the women at the forefront, and it's the men who are basically acting as the shield of the women in power who are leading this revolution for the toppling of patriarchy. This is straight mm -hmm. out of the pages of what I wrote in that, especially in the 15th unity of the Bible, the first gate of the 15th unity of the Bible. I, I wrote this, and now it is, is, it is transpiring in, in Iran. Absolutely, Sheikh, and it's absolutely uh, beautiful to live in this time frame. And I always thought that the, the period that we're in, the 2020s, from 2020 through 2029, going into 2030s, we are going to see the world change as we know it. And it's changing right in front of us. And now with the divine justice that's taking place and uh, a great shake like yourself, who's part of this manifestation, who helped to manifest what's taking place in this realm. Because we, a, lot, a lot of the, the teachers and guides that come in our lives are the lights that are holding this world together. You have been that light for not only me, but for countless others. And your work, with your hard work you have done with the Bayan and other things which have now come into manifestation and 
And it's, it's such an honor and a privilege to see something like this taking place in our lifetime. And I believe these tyrants all over the world shake, no matter what country or uh, tribe that they're in, they have to start counting their days now because the next generation, especially the Persian people, they are a warrior people. And I know they're going to take back control from these criminals that have uh, taken their land hostage and taken their resources and their culture and who they really are. And as time goes on, like like you said, in your daughter's generation and the ones after them, they will see the fruits of our labors and the fruits of those that have struggled hard against this regime. And uh, for the Iranian people that are listening, please take heed to what Sheikh Wahid Azal is instructing you, that you keep pressing on in this fight. And inshallah, you know, maybe in the next year or so, um, Salban and I can be in Iran together because I'd like to show you around the motherland. Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, through, my, through my mother's side, I have Iranian Persian ancestry because at that time, if you go back into history, before the, the, uh, the colonists made the modern day maps, Iran and Pakistan, it all used to be part of the original Persian Empire. Yes, they were, yeah. So, inshallah, in the future, as time goes on, I would love to go to Iran, the, uh, the, where, where the Alamut is, where the Hashashin were, where the uh, Shiraz is, and see all of the great Sufi teachings and saints. And, of course, with my Murshid, inshallah, I hope to do that next year. Inshallah, inshallah, it will happen. So let's leave it here, um, because I think we've... we've pretty much covered what we needed to cover and uh, all power to the people of Iran. Definitely. And for those that are listening, the counterpunch article that Sheikh Wahid has recently published, I will put that in the description below, including the links for all of his channels and everything else that he is doing. So thank you all and Noor Alaikum until next time for part 19. Thank you. Yeah,